The full moon hangs heavy in the night sky over the dense jungle canopy. Below, the darkened palm trees stand silent in the humid air, festooned with vines and lianas, and tropical insects hum in the undergrowth. The night is quiet and dark here, far from the city, in one of the farthest, most secluded provinces of the Philippines. One would hardly expect anyone to be out at this time of night. The young woman is hurrying home, carrying a lantern before her face so that she can see where she's going in the pitch black of the night. Her swollen belly reveals that she's at least several months pregnant, her new middle throwing her off balance just enough that she has to be careful not to stumble. A woman in her condition, she thinks, shouldn't be out at this time of night and certainly shouldn't have to do household chores like this. But the work has to get done, no matter what. She carries a basket of wet laundry under her other arm. She is returning from washing her clothes in the river and, if she had planned things out better, she would have been home long before the moon rose. Unfortunately, she spent far too much time gossiping with several other village women before getting to work on scrubbing her filthy clothes against the rocks. Luckily, it's not too far from the river back to her home in the village. The worst thing that might happen, she reminds herself, is that she might lose her footing in the dark and trip over a rock or a root. There's no chance that she might run afoul of some nocturnal animal, she tells herself, even though the sudden chills down her spine and sweat dripping from her brow reveals the truth, that she doesn't believe that at all, and, in fact, she's getting more and more nervous as she staggers through the dark. It isn't just the threat of wild animals. She remembers the stories that her mother told her when she was a little girl, all about sinister supernatural monsters that live in these woods. Of course, those are just stories invented to scare children, she tells herself. She's a grown woman now, about to have a child of her own. She shouldn't be worried about boogeymen. She just needs to keep her head on her shoulders, and she'll be sure to arrive home safely. The lantern throws its light over a figure standing below the crook of a catmon tree. The woman jolts, nearly dropping her laundry. She gulps back a scream as she realizes that what she sees isn't a wild animal, but rather a person. Oh, sorry, says the young woman, her voice shaking a little. I didn't think anyone else was still out this late. I thought you were a wild animal. Don't you worry, little one, says the figure in a soft, sibilant voice. The figure steps forward, and the young woman recognizes her. It's an old woman from the village, her back hunched, and her long white hair falling over her shoulders in a messy tangle. The young woman feels inexplicably nervous running into this particular villager here in the jungle at night. Many of the village kids whisper that she's actually a witch who has all kinds of weird supernatural powers. Even some of the village elders are afraid to cross her, for fear of getting cursed. Where are you going at this hour? Someone in your condition shouldn't exert yourself so much. I'm just heading home, says the young woman, hefting the basket of laundry for emphasis. It's dangerous to be out so late alone. Here, let me walk home with you. There's safety in numbers, you know. Th thank you. The young woman almost wants to protest that she doesn't need any help getting home because she really does not want to spend any more time with this old woman. But at the same time, she is reluctant to say anything that might insult her. After all, even if the young woman doesn't believe in witchcraft, it's not like she wants to take any chances. Besides, the truth is that she is rather frightened of being alone in the dark, and any company is better than nothing, even if it's this strange old woman. How far along are you, honey? says the old woman, placing a hand against the surface of the young woman's protruding belly. The young woman grimaces. She doesn't like this old woman intruding on her personal space like this. The old woman's hands are wrinkled and veiny, flecked with liver spots, and her fingers topped with gnarled talons. The young woman wants to cry out at the sight of them, but she bites her tongue. Instead, she answers the old woman's probing question as calmly and politely as she can. Very nice, very nice says the old woman, her roomy eyes never straying from the young woman's belly, and her hands still rubbing against her stomach as if she's trying to reach something within. The old woman makes a strange sound in her throat, like she's smacking her lips in hunger, but it's hard to see anything in the dark. The young woman can only nod in confusion, but she quickens her pace. She hopes that she can get home soon, and once she's home, she can get away from her unfortunate travel companion. The old woman keeps pace, grabbing her younger traveling companion by the arm and holding tight. Her grip is surprisingly firm for such a seemingly frail old woman, and the young woman again wonders if maybe there's something supernatural about this ominous crone. She wants to pull her arm away, but the old woman's long claws pinch cruelly into her flesh. It's as if the old woman is silently warning her, don't pull away, I'm too strong for you to escape. What a sweet little bundle of joy you carry there. 
says the old woman, as if speaking to herself. What a delectable little burden. The young woman knows that she's still talking about her unborn baby, but all this mumbling just makes her more worried. They continue walking, the young woman staring resolutely at the small circle of illumination thrown by her lantern onto the path ahead, doing everything in her power to not look at the old woman standing at her side for fear that she might scream. Why is she so nervous? Worse, does the old woman sense her fear? The young woman has heard that witches are easily offended, and that's the last thing that she needs now. She continues walking, the old woman gibbering and whispering in her ear, plying her with odd questions about her pregnancy. Eating well, have you? You know, it's very important to eat right when you're carrying, so that the baby can be born strong and healthy. Right, says the young woman. She really doesn't need this unsolicited advice. She heaves an audible sigh of relief as the village comes into view over the next bluff. Thank God, she thinks, I'm almost home. She just hopes that the old woman will take a hint and leave her alone once they arrive at her doorstep. She wonders if this old woman might try to come into her home or maybe steer her towards some other destination. But what can she do? All she can do is keep walking home and hope for the best. Is it just you, is it? Is the father in the picture, hmm? I haven't seen you with any young men lately, have I? Asks the old woman. Her nosiness is really starting to irritate the young woman, enough that she almost forgets her fear. No, it's just me, says the young woman automatically. She immediately regrets that confession. What is this old woman planning? Is she up to some mischief? Now she knows that the young woman lives alone, and there won't be anyone around to see whatever this crone is planning. Her grip tightens on the young woman's arm as if to warn her again. The village is quiet and dark. Everyone else has already gone to bed by now, so the pair of them walk down narrow, still streets. The only sound is the crunch, crunch, crunch of gravel under their feet. After what seems like an eternity, they arrive at the front gate of the young woman's house. Well, here I am she says, a little too loudly and firmly to be completely casual. This is my home. Thanks for keeping me company on my way home. To her immense relief, the old woman lets go of her arm. The young woman immediately pulls away, rubbing the deep bruises left by the old woman's gnarled talons. Think nothing of it, my dear. The old woman smiles widely, a long rope of saliva dribbling from her slack lips. Her teeth look jagged and misshapen. It's hard to see in the dark, but they look more like the teeth of a wild beast than a human. It must be your eyes playing tricks on her in the dim light, though. The young woman can't help but recoil in disgust, but luckily her face is hidden in shadows, so the old woman doesn't seem to notice. I'm happy to help. I hope to see you again very soon. The young woman doesn't wait any longer. Even before the old woman turns to leave, the young woman scampers across her yard and yanks open her door. She runs inside and pulls the door shut behind her. Her heart is racing, and her breath comes in ragged pants. She can feel the baby in her belly kick, suddenly agitated by its mother's fear. Shh, it's okay, she coos softly, patting her stomach and hoping that her tender voice will help to calm her baby. I know you're scared. I'm scared too. That old woman frightened me half to death. They say that she's a witch and I'd almost believe it. What a strange experience. She pulls the curtain aside and peeps out the window. The old woman is gone. The young woman looks up and down the street, but sees no sign of her traveling companion. She inhales deeply and feels the tension drain from her body as she lets her breath out. Thank goodness that's all over. She can't explain why this whole night has unnerved her so much, but there was just something so uncanny about that strange old woman. She's glad to be rid of her. The young woman tries to put the whole experience out of her head as she prepares for bed. As she pulls on her nightclothes, she startles when she hears something heavy and loud clatter across the roof. It's not unusual for roof rats or other nocturnal animals to scurry across the roof at night, but this sounds louder than usual. It's probably nothing, she tells herself as she climbs into bed. I'm still just upset about meeting that old woman on my way home from the river. That whole thing must have jangled my nerves worse than I thought if I'm flinching at every little sound. I'll be fine when it's light out. The sooner I get to sleep, the sooner it'll be morning. Even though her nerves are rattled, she is quite tired after a long day and it doesn't take long before she drifts off to sleep. The young woman's eyes close, and her breathing becomes slow and steady, the shallow rhythms of sleep. Inside her head, she might be troubled by strange dreams, but to any outside observer, she is dead to the world. Asleep in bed, she doesn't react to the clattering on the roof. Whatever is up there is making an awful racket as it drags itself over the roof tiles. If someone were around to watch, they would see that whatever is on the roof is no rat. 
It's a darkened figure, almost big enough to be human, but strangely truncated. Two massive leathery wings unfurl behind it, extended to help the strange creature maintain its balance upon the roof. It drags itself forward using only its hands, long talons tapping at the roof shingles as it seeks a loose tile, anything that will give it access to the house below. Its finger finds a crack. Wheezing and panting, the creature leans forward, putting its eye to the crack to peer into the room below. The young woman is asleep in bed directly below, and that's exactly what this creature was hoping for. The young woman mumbles in her sleep, her mind filled with disturbing dreams. She's oblivious when, all of a sudden, something drops through that crack in the ceiling. It's long and slippery and covered in thick, wet mucus. It looks, for all the world, like a tongue, but it's far too long to be any human tongue. It drops lower and lower into the room, extending closer and closer to the young woman sleeping in her bed. The disgusting appendage caresses her face, leaving a wet slug trail of saliva across her forehead as if it's looking for something, then brushes against her lips, and the tongue seems to find what it wants. Instantly, it snakes into her open mouth and shoots down her throat. The young woman starts to sputter and choke, her limbs thrashing and flailing, but still, she is held fast in the grip of sleep. Some wild nightmare is playing out in her head. Perhaps she fantasizes that she is drowning in a river or choking on some food or being strangled by a fiend. Whatever she's thinking, it couldn't be further from the truth that an alien tongue has jammed itself down her throat. The tongue pushes deeper and deeper inside her until it makes contact with her womb. A trained anatomist might balk at the idea that the tongue could find her womb by accessing her throat, but somehow it has done exactly this, snaking its way through the labyrinth of her insides to find her unborn baby. A sticky aperture opens up at the tip of the tongue, revealing that the tongue is hollow, like a massive soda straw. It sucks up the baby like a vacuum, slurping it up, 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 and out, the bulge of its prey traveling up the length of the tongue like a wild pig swallowed by a boa constrictor. Once the baby is gone, the tongue slides out of the woman's mouth and retracts back toward the ceiling, disappearing back through the subtle crack. There's a clatter on the roof again, followed by the soft flutter of leathery wings. The young woman settles back into a deep, still sleep, the awful sensation of suffocation having passed. The rest of the night is peaceful and quiet, but when she awakens the next morning, she finds that the nightmare isn't over. She wakes with a strange, empty feeling in her guts. Something is very wrong. She throws aside her covers and stares at herself in shock. Her baby is gone. Her rounded belly has deflated back to its pre-pregnancy state, and she can sense, as only a mother can, that she is no longer carrying something within her. She shrieks in terror at this bizarre revelation. What could have happened? What could be responsible? That young woman just had an encounter with SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is a humanoid subspecies native to the Philippines, dubbed Homo sapiens visceralis, but known by many local names across the Philippine Islands, including the Oswang, the Tik Tik, or simply the Viscera Sucker. But it is most commonly known as the Mananangal. During the day, an instance of SCP-5201 looks like an ordinary human, at a glance, there is no way to immediately distinguish an instance of SCP-5201 from a regular member of Homo sapiens. However, Foundation researchers have found that there do exist certain retinal irregularities unique to SCP-5201, so the agency has developed a portable retinal scanner for use in quickly identifying instances of SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is far easier to tell from an ordinary human at night when it undergoes a strange and startling metamorphosis. It unfolds a pair of membranous wings, resembling those of a bat, from its back. Even more startling, its torso splits in two. Its upper torso then flies off in search of prey, while its lower torso is hidden in a secure location until SCP-5201 can reconnect. SCP-5201 will seek out human prey, most likely relying on a keenly attuned sense of smell, and, once it has chosen a victim, will alight on the roof of their home and then snake its preternaturally long, tube-like tongue into the house below so that it can feed. SCP-5201 feeds by inserting its tongue into the orifices of unfortunate sleepers and sucking out their internal organs as easily as you would suck soda through a straw. SCP-5201 will happily eat human livers, stomachs, and intestines but its favorite food is unborn fetuses, so much so that instances of SCP-5201 disguised in their human form can often be recognized by their tendency to drool at the sight of pregnant women. 
SCP-5201 are well known to local humans who live in fear of nocturnal attacks by the dreaded Mananangal. Interestingly, SCP-5201 can be repelled by Abrahamic holy objects like rosary beads or crucifixes, or can be staked through the heart with sharpened shafts of bamboo, very similar to the means used against vampires in Western folklore. SCP-5201 is especially vulnerable when its upper torso is out hunting, so it will always take the utmost care to hide its abandoned lower torso in a secret, secure location. If you can find the hidden lower torso, it is possible to kill SCP-5201 by sprinkling its exposed viscera with spices like garlic, salt, or vinegar, or failing that, even ash or urine. This causes an unusual reaction that is not yet fully understood by Foundation researchers, but will prevent the two halves from rejoining. If the two halves of the Mananangal cannot rejoin before dawn, sunlight will kill the creature. If none of these methods are available, it is also possible to repel SCP-5201 by using a specialized whip fashioned from the tail of a stingray. The SCP Foundation currently has an undisclosed number of domesticated SCP-5201 instances held in the fauna containment wing of Site-235. Because this species has been known to practice cannibalism, each specimen is to be held in its own personal containment cell. While there are obvious ethical and logistical concerns with feeding human organs to SCP-5201, the Foundation has discovered that SCP-5201 can still easily thrive on a diet of any newborn mammal with a mass of at least one kilogram. Piglets have so far proven to be the most cost-effective and available options, but other species can be substituted as necessary. All entrances to SCP-5201 containment cells are to be guarded by at least two Level 2 personnel equipped with stingray whips, crucifixes, or some other object found to cause harm to SCP-5201. Unlike humans, SCP-5201 have an unusual asexual reproductive process. The lower body can regenerate a new upper torso via a process similar to epimorphic regeneration observed in autonomous lizards. Upper torso of an SCP-5201 would leave behind the parent's lower torso to search for a compatible female human. SCP-5201 would attack and consume this human, claiming her lower torso as its own smearing ash, urine, or spices into the exposed innards of the lower torso inhibits this process and prevents effective reproduction. The exact origin of SCP-5201 is unknown. Although the creature is endemic throughout the Philippines, and historical records indicate that it has inhabited the island since at least 1500, when it was first described by Spanish sailors to the islands, fossil remains and genetic testing indicate that it is actually an invasive species from outside the Philippine archipelago. SCP-5201 is currently believed to be extinct in the wild, following eradication efforts by the Foundation in the 1990s. An epidemic of SCP-5201 attacks in the early 90s prompted the SCP Foundation to join forces with the Supernatural Committee of the Philippines and the Global Occult Coalition to take action to prevent SCP-5201 from spreading to other countries. Dubbed Project Dipsy, the operation involved amnesticizing the major cities of the Philippines, funding propaganda campaigns to dismiss SCP-5201 as a product of folklore and urban legends, and eventually domesticating the surviving SCP-5201 population for cellular regeneration research. Because of its aggressiveness and taste for human flesh, SCP-5201 specimens regularly attempt to breach containment and thus have been given the designation Euclid. And while the SCP Foundation has done its best to eliminate the threat of SCP-5201 in the wild, there's no guarantee that a few instances of this vicious monster might have slipped through the cracks and possibly even spread out into the wider world beyond its home in the Philippines. You still might want to search your room for any suspicious cracks or holes before you bed down for the night, because there are very few things less pleasant than waking up from restless dreams to find a long, slimy tongue jammed down your throat. If you want to support this important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1013, Cockatrice, for another tale of a mythological monster that's all too real. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.